All right, hello everyone. Let's go ahead and get started with this webinar. Uh, this webinar is on improving, in, on improving your analysis productivity in SOLIDWORKS simulation. My name is Taryn Packer, and I'm a simulation specialist over here at Go Engineer. So this webinar will go over some neat tips and tricks you might not know about in simulation. We're going to give you several ways to speed up analysis preparation and run times, as well as improve accuracy using the simulation professional uh, level tools. First, we'll be, we're going to be going over the load case manager. Then we'll be going over the submodeling tool in the simulation professional tools. If you don't know what those simulation studies are, that's OK. Uh, that's why we're going. We're having this webinar to go over them with you. Uh, lastly, we're going to be going over some automation tips using the design study tool, and then some tips and tricks on how to choose which solvers to to use in SolidWorks simulation. All right. So the first thing we're going to be looking into is the load case manager. Basically. The benefits of the load case manager are that you can run many different types of loading conditions and obtain accurate results on them very quickly. We're going to apply uh, gravity, water, and wind to our case study. Here's our case study right here. And it's a silo full of water, basically. And we're going to have a gravity load the, the water pressure load and then the wind load coming in in the negative Z direction hitting the side of the silo and we're going to see what what that looks like in the load case manager. So I'm going to hop into SOLIDWORKS now and show you that case study. Here's the silo. Uh, just a quick overview of how I've set this up in SOLIDWORKS simulation. Basically, I have a lot of solid mesh and shell mesh. Using the load case manager with a mixed mesh study is perfectly fine. Everything is bonded together. I don't have any no penetration contact sets or any of that in here. My The bottom feet of my silo are fixed to the ground as if they're in cement, which is what would happen in real life with something like this. And the main part of this silo is I have the gravity load here. I have a pressure load right here, which simulates the water inside of the silo. And then I have three pressure loads at the different panels um, indicating the wind load. This is from a wind load in the negative Z direction that is 40 meters per second. And these, the, these first three panels here are, have a higher pressure load than these side panels due to the wind pressure and the circular nature of the silo. I have just a little mesh control on the legs because they're the high areas of interest. And I've already run this, so we don't have to sit here and watch it run in this webinar. just want to give you a quick preview of what the results look like side of the load case manager. And now I want to show you how to set up the load case manager. To get to the load case manager option, what you need to do is right click the very top simulation feature, whatever it, it could be named, it's named whatever you named the simulation. So the very top one, right click it, and then go to load case manager, left click that. That brings up the load case manager right here. So the setup of a load case manager, first you set up the primary loads, then you set up the load case combinations, then optionally you can set up the track results option. That's not necessary to run the load case manager, but it can be very helpful if you're trying to track specific data points. So to set up the primary loads first, what you need to do is press this green plus mark right here that puts in a new load case. It's always called load case one. And I always, you don't have to rename these. I always like to rename them to keep track of them. So this first load case, I'm going to call it my 
gravity load, gravity load, and then I can press the green plus again and rename this second load case. I'm going to rename this full silo load. That's, uh, that's going to simulate the water pressure inside of the silo. I'm going to press this green plus one more time and rename this third one. I'm going to call it wind load. All right, so now I have my three primary load cases. Now I need to turn them on individually. So these first three columns are the gravity loads in the X, Y, Z directions. This first column is the actual gravity load. So I just come to my gravity row, click on this suppress option right here, click the little down arrow, and I can turn on my gravity load there. All of my loads in my simulation feature tree will show up right here. So you have to set up your loads first in your simulation feature tree before they'll show up in your load case manager. Now for the full silo load, I go to, in this row, I go to the water pressure column and I turn that on for the full silo load. Then for the wind load, I come to these three columns and I turn each of them on. So now my wind load doesn't have gravity or the water pressure, but it does have the wind pressures. And same with the full silo and the gravity load. They each have uh, their specific load turned on while the rest of them are suppressed in that row. Now I've set up my primary load cases properly. The next thing I need to do is come to my load case combinations. When I press the green plus here, it's going to be a little bit different it brings up an edit equation box. And by default, the first two primary loads are automatically uh, going to be added together. So this is my gravity load plus my full silo load. I can add more loads to this by putting a plus mark or a minus mark. That brings up my functions or divide brings up my functions or uh, times uh, multiplication brings up my functions. So any of those options will bring up your functions and you can add more loads in. For now though, I'm just going to leave this as gravity plus full silo load. And that's going to be my full silo load case combination. It's called combination one. I'm going to rename it full silo. So this is a uh, full silo without any wind. I'm going to hit plus again. And this time I'm going to have a full silo and then I'm going to hit plus and I'm going to put my full silo primary or my wind load in. Sorry. I'll put my wind load in next. So I've got all three and this is going to be a full silo with a wind load hitting it. So I'm going to call this one full silo and wind load. And then I'm going to put one more in here, press the green plus. And this time I want an empty silo. So I'm actually going to hit backspace, get rid of my full silo, but still out of wind load. And you can do any sort of equations here you like. I could double the wind load by hitting, by putting a two times here. Sorry two times and that would double the wind load um, and whatever you want to do there. So I'm just going to leave this with gravity plus wind load and rename this empty silo and wind load. All right, so now I have three load case combinations. You can put in as many primary loads and as many load case combinations as you like. We're just going to leave it on as three each. Uh, then you can do a track results. Again, this is optional. I can run it right now, but I'm, I do want to track some results. I track results by using a sensor. If you guys haven't seen sensors before, then I'll show you how to use them. You just click add sensor right here. 
The sensor is a SOLIDWORKS level tool, not a simulation level tool. And you can add any of these variables. You can track any of these variables in SOLIDWORKS. But I want to track simulation data. Within the simulation data, I can track stress, strain, displacements, any of these simulation variables here. I want to track stress. I'm going to track von Mises stress. And let's say I want to do megapascals as my units. I can track the maximum, minimum, or average stress over the whole model. Or I could track maximum, minimum, average over a selected entity. So I'm going to do a selected entity. And I'm just going to track the underside of this plate because that's where the most of the stress is. So I can just do a select other real quickly. Choose that underside of that plate. You can see it highlighted there in blue. And now I've set up my sensor. I can press OK and my sensor automatically pops in there to be tracked during this load case uh, manager. So I could hit run right now and it would start the analysis. That would take too long for this webinar. So I'm just going to pop into an analysis I've already run the load case on and show you a completed load case manager. Uh, I want you to notice here that it's taking a little while to switch between studies. And I also ran several of these studies. I ran an empty silo, full silo as their individual studies. Um, and imagine having 50 different studies that I had to do and switching between them to compare results, uh, running each one individually. That can get quite annoying which is one of the main benefits of the load case manager because it's all in one screen and you can switch between the results very quickly and set them up very quickly as well. All right, it's just about there. Okay, now we're in this full analysis one, uh, simulation. It already has a load case right there, so all I need to do is right click it, view edit. And now I'm in this load case that I've already set up previously. I'm going to go to the results. And it, if I click on one of these primary load cases, let's just do gravity, then it activates the load case results. They come in a separate folder. I can click on the stress. And there's the gravity stress. Remember, this is 850 times the deformation scale. so. It's basically taking the results that would happen in real life and timesing them by 857. So it over exaggerates what's actually happening in real life. But let's let's say I want to switch to a full silo load case combination. I can just switch over to that. And it will activate those results for me. Or let's see what happens when I put a wind load in there. I can grab those results as well. You can see it kind of tipping to the side due to those wind results. So I can switch between these very quickly. And then that sensor I set up uh, with the track results, those results are right here. So I can compare and contrast them very easily just in a table and see which simulations I think are best according to the uh, sensor that's, that's tracking these results. So that's kind of a brief overview of the load case manager. I'm going to hop back into my PowerPoint here. All right, so just a quick summary of uh, the load case manager. All your results are consolidated into one window. You can quickly switch between studies all in the one window. And the software takes advantage of the primary load cases. Uh, they, it, it solves the primary load cases separately, uh, and then when it's doing the combinations, it doesn't have to deal with constraints like fixtures or anything like that. All it has to do is uh, add, subtract the formulas for the, the, load case, the primary load cases. So it can solve the load case combinations very, very quickly, and that's a huge benefit with the load case manager. So the next thing we're going to go over is submodeling. Uh, 
Submodeling was made so the simulation user can get extremely accurate results without needing to, uh, so that they can analyze large problems without taking, without it taking uh, long periods of time. So what basically what submodeling does is it zooms in on one or more locations of interest, excluding the rest of the analysis from the submodel simulation while keeping the correct loading conditions on the areas of interest. Um, this picture right here is a really good indication of possible structures that could use a submodeling analysis. Uh, large structures like bridges or buildings. Uh, take the Eiffel Tower, for instance. If I was to run a simulation on the Eiffel Tower, I wouldn't want it to. I wouldn't want to run a simulation, a really fine mesh simulation, on the entire Eiffel Tower. Uh, that would take a really long time. So what the submodeling option does is it allows you to analyze the whole thing. It's called a parent study. The whole thing as a very coarse analysis and then to do a submodeling study where I actually cut away the parts that I don't want. So I could cut away everything but the feet if I wanted to analyze the feet of the Eiffel Tower. Just cut away all this top section. But the submodel is still connected to the parent study. So the, the feet that I'm analyzing will be uh, loaded from the parent study so I can really mesh, increase the mesh density in those feet and get very quick accurate results um, while having very high confidence that the same loading conditions are being applied to the feet even though I've gotten rid of the rest of the tower. This is the case study that I'm going to go over for some modeling. It's basically just a bicycle frame and I, I cut away this section right here, right under the seat, right under where the seat would be. And I'm going to zoom in on that section and just do a submodel on just that section. So I'm going to hop back into SolidWorks here, switch over to my bike frame. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown on how I set this up. Basically, everything is made of 1060 alloy. and everything is bonded and then for my fixtures I have this back part here where it would be connecting to the back wheel I have that as just a regular fixture restraint and then up here on the top part of the frame where it's connecting to the front wheel I have an elastic support which is going to simulate the shock absorbers that are connected to the front wheel then I have several loads here. These first two loads are 20 kilograms of force that simulate uh, a person leaning on the handlebars. And then these two loads in the back are the person pedaling. So I have those four loads on here. And let's go ahead and look at the stress on, well, let's, yeah, let's look at the stress here. As you can see, it's a pretty dense analysis. Um, my, my mesh is very, very dense, and I'm getting pretty good results everywhere. But if I look at the solver messages, right click results and click on solver message, I've got over 800,000 degrees of freedom. That is quite a lot for one analysis. Uh, so this is why I would want to use a submodel because I don't want to have to run the entire parent study over and over again just so I can find results in the area of interest which is right here under the seat. So to start a submodel you do the exact same thing as starting the load case. I would right click the very top feature whatever it's named and there's an option here called create sub model. So I'm going to click on that. I have some advantages and limitations that you can go through if you do this in the future. And basically what this is doing is I have literally cut away from the rest of the model the part that I'm going to do the submodel on. And something that's very important to remember, those areas that you cut need to be bonded to the rest of the parent study. There can't be a no penetration contact set between an area that you cut away and the rest of the part file. So at these three locations they are bonded, not uh, no sliding contact sets. 
Now, uh, I could try and find what I'm looking for in the checklist here. If I check something, you'll see it highlights on my graphics window, but I don't want that part. So I would have to go through and check these, and that would be kind of a pain. So an easier way to do it is to actually just click on the parts that you want to include in the graphics window, and they're automatically checked in the submodeling list here. So I'm going to click on these five parts. Those are the parts that I want to do for my submodel. Press OK. It gets rid of every everything but the part files that I chose. And I, I have a list of those here, and then I have excluded bodies here. So this is everything in the parent study that has been excluded from this submodel analysis and will no longer be meshed and analyzed. Just these five parts are analyzed and meshed. Everything is still bonded, but now my fixtures have changed. I now have a displacement from parent study, and that displacement is on the, the four faces that are directly connected to the parent study. So what literally happens is the, the computer analyzes the displacement that's put onto these part files in the submodel and it puts those same displacements uh, on the submodel even though the parent study isn't there any longer, which is why you know for sure that the loading conditions on the submodel are the same as they were in the parent study, even though uh, my, my external loads are gone and my fixtures are different. I can put new external loads in if I want to, um, and then if I go into mesh, I can create a mesh here. Uh, meshing is the exact same as a parent study. I can, I can put in a curvature-based mesh. I can increase the fineness of the mesh if I wanted to. Press OK. Now I have a finer mesh in place here. Um, if I wanted to, I could even put in a mesh control and put in some local mesh. We'll just go with this for now. And I'm going to run this analysis. Shouldn't take too long. As you can see, my degrees of freedom, even though I pulled it up to fine and my parent mesh was more on the coarse side, uh, instead of having 800,000 degrees of freedom, I now only have just over 100,000 degrees of freedom. And see how fast that ran. And I can animate this so you can kind of see the displacement that's happening. That displacement comes directly from the parent study. And I can review my results here. I can come in here to activate a stress plot. My yield strength of my 1060 alloy is 27.57 megapascals. So I'm actually going to make that my top, my maximum amount here, 27.574. Press OK. And now I can see if I'm yielding in anywhere. Uh, this mesh is kind of getting in the way, so a quick way to turn it off, all I need to do is right click my chart over here, and I can des deselect show mesh and get rid of that mesh very easily or I could bring it back just as easily by doing the same thing. So I can zoom in on some areas of interest and see that there's some hot spots right there. There's a little bit of a hot spot over here but it doesn't look like I have any yielding, maybe uh, close to yielding right here. So I can I can really increase that mesh density and because I'm only analyzing a very small part, I can run another study and increase the mesh density even more and, uh, and run what's called a mesh convergence analysis to make sure that my mesh has converged and is giving me fully accurate results. Doing a mesh convergence on a large parent study uh, can be kind of difficult, and so doing it on a submodel is a huge benefit. All right, so now just a quick summary of the, the submodel. Um, basically, you can obtain accurate results on just the areas of interest while disregarding everything else. You can speed up the analysis in critical areas of interest. And 
you can easily mesh and run several studies in a row uh, to quickly obtain the mesh convergence point and make sure you're getting super accurate results from your mesh. All right, the last big tool that I'm going to show you here, uh, we do have some tips and tricks after this, but this tool in the simulation professional level is called the design optimization tool. It's basically an automation tool that you can use. Um, one of the main reasons why it's used is to decrease mass in a part file of interest or an assembly of interest, uh, decrease the mass while uh, maintaining as much strength in the, in the design as possible, which is what's happened with this design here that I'll show you in just a second. So with the design automation tool, I can change the design loads, uh, change, I can change the loads, I can change the geometry dimensions, and I can change the materials all at once. So it's a little bit like the load case manager, except it can do even more. Um, I, I do that by changing the variables and constraints uh, that drive the analysis, and I'll show that to you once we hop back into SOLIDWORKS in just a second. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, let's show that to you. So I'm going to go to this cantilever bracket file. Right now, this cantilever bracket, uh, basically you can imagine it holding up a bookshelf. It's one side of a bookshelf. I have screw holes here, and they're just regular fixtures. And then I have a pressure load of 750 PSI. Um, that's simulating uh, books sitting on this shelf. So I just want to show you the stress results on this guy real quickly. I'm getting a maximum stress of 68 megapascals right here by this bolt. But let's say I wanted to uh, pull out some material and decrease the overall weight of this cantilever bracket while still having the ability uh, to hold up my bookshelf. So something like this. So I'm going to put a hole in there, but this is a pretty small hole and maybe I want to change the position of the hole. Maybe I want to make it larger or smaller. So the best way to do that is to do it in a design study. One of the best ways. So I'm going to come into, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm actually going to show you how to start a design study first. Um, I'm going to click New Study. I'm going to go to Design Study. Press OK. And this starts a brand new design study. Uh, just a reminder, I'm going to answer the questions at the end. So if you think your question hasn't been answered, that's OK. I'm going to answer them at the end of the webinar. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to put in some variables. Uh, to add a variable, you click on Add Parameter. And it brings up this Parameters box. Um, I've already put these variables in for convenience sake. So I, I can literally add, see how the variables or the, the dimensions are highlighting. I can literally add dimensions to be tracked uh, and to be changed within the, the within this study and I can press OK and to add them all I need to do is click them from the list any any that I any variables that I put into the add parameter will show up in this list and all I need to do is click on them just like that all right so I have three options here I can do a range with step where I put in a minimum and a maximum, and then I put in a step size to go from the min to the maximum dimensions. Or I could do literally discrete values where I specifically put in the dimensions I want for this specific dimension. Or I can do range where I just do a min and a maximum. I'm going to do range for all three of these and then the computer chooses the step size. So let's say I wanted to do uh, 10 millimeters to 25 millimeters for both DV1 and DV2, 25 
And for this last variable here, you can see it's a little bit larger. I'm going to do 20 to 50 millimeters. So I've got my minimums and my maximums, and those will be changing within the design study. Now I need to put in constraints. What the constraints are, they come from sensors. We've, I've already shown you in the load case manager how to set up a sensor. Um, so I'm not going to show that to you again. These are the sensors that I've already set up. Let's say I wanted to track the stress over the whole part file. I can say stress one is less than, let's say, 300 megapascals. So as it's going through these variables and running several studies over and over again, it's going to track each one individually and it's going to say, are you less than 300 megapascals? If any one study goes over 300 megapascals, it will flag it as incorrect. And I could also put in, I could track uh, the displacement as well. Let's say I wanted to do is less than, let's say, one millimeter. Um, and that would make, make sure that it doesn't go over one millimeter. Now goals, goals are optional. If you want to optimize your analysis, you have to put in a goal, but you don't have to optimize your analysis. I could uncheck optimize if I wanted to. But let's say I wanted to optimize the mass and I could minimize it, maximize it, or do a is closest to and pick a specific value. I usually like to minimize. So it's the least amount of mass while maintaining these constraints uh, for these variables. So I'm not going to run this. I'm going to hop into the optimization I've already ran. And here are the results for that. And the great thing about the optimi one of the great things about the optimization tool is it literally runs each of these configurations and you can see them changing in the graphics window. So it's literally creating m multiple configurations with one variable change at a time and it runs each one. And if I activate the stress results, you can see it even changes and the stress results change as well for each one. So I can see the stress results for each. Uh, the ones that failed, the ones that went over those that 300 megapascal, they failed. So this one failed because it's too thin and it went over the 300. This one also failed also because it's too thin and it went over the 300. My optimal version is this one right here. It's just under the 300, 286 megapascals. So it's still going to be able to hold up that bookshelf, uh, but I'm reducing the, a huge amount of mass by punching this hole in there. All right, so that's, that's it for the design analysis. That's the benefits of the design analysis. Now, just some quick tips on uh, solver settings. There are two main solver settings. There's the FFE Plus, which is called uh, it's called Fast Finite Element Plus. That's one of the solvers, and the Direct Sparse. I'm gonna hop back into SolidWorks one more time here, so I can show you where to find those solver settings. If I right-click the very top feature of any analysis, I can go to Properties, and my solvers are right here in the Options tab of my Simulation Properties. And I, I can choose a direct sparse solver, FFE plus solver, large problem direct sparse, Intel direct sparse, Intel network direct sparse. I'll go over each of these real quickly. The main two are direct sparse and FFE plus. All right, so FFE plus uses approximate techniques to solve the simulation. So it can run much larger degree of freedom with uh, larger meshes because it just it uses these approximate techniques. The direct sparse, on the other hand, solves for each degree of freedom in the entire mesh, uh, no matter what. 
So if I've got a million degrees of freedom and it's solving for all of them, that can take quite a long time. Uh, so that's a little bit of a limitation for direct sparse. The limitation for FFE plus is this screen capture right here. I ran an analysis on a pressure vessel and I ran it with FFE plus just to see what happened, what would happen. And I got this error message. Basically, this is saying that the FFE plus can't solve for this because it's too complex. The complexity comes in from the no penetration contact sets and the bolts that are uh, part of this pressure vessel. So it's too complex for the FFE plus to solve. And it says, do you want to switch to the Intel direct sparse solver instead? This is showing an analysis that I did on a cantilever beam, just a very simple analysis on a cantilever beam where I fixed one end of the cantilever beam and I put a force load on the other end. And I just wanted to see what would happen in a very simple analysis like that. The only differences, the only things I changed were the degrees of freedom. I started out with 50,000 degrees of freedom and I went up to 2 million degrees of freedom for both the FFE plus solver and for a direct sparse solver. As you can see, the FFE plus solver, the, even at 2 million, its fastest solve time was 43 seconds. So it was still able to solve very, very quickly at 2 million. The direct sparse, on the other hand, uh, right around just under 500,000, it started going up in the amount of time it took to solve. And at 2 million, it took over a thousand seconds to solve a very simple cantilever beam analysis. So direct sparse is really good for complex analyses with no penetration, bolts, pins, springs, things like that. FFV Plus is really good for simple analyses that only have bonded contact sets, maybe one uh, no penetration contact set, um, but mostly bonded. Uh, but FFV Plus is really good for high degree of freedom problems. Direct sparse is kind of poor in high degree of freedom problems. Uh, but that's where the large problem direct sparse, the Intel direct sparse, or the network direct sparse comes into play. Those three options are much better at solving high degree of freedom type analyses while still solving for very complex analyses. Um, they just take a long time to solve you in some cases. So that's it for the solver settings. Um, real quickly here, uh, we went over these three tools in the simulation professional toolbox. There's lots of other professional level tools that you can get access to with the professional level toolbox. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about that, please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you're interested in learning about our simulation premium tools, which are our higher level simulation tools like nonlinear analyses, things like that, please reach out to us for that as well. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter at goengineer.com forward slash sign up. You can sign up for any possible training you want to look into. If you want to learn more about the professional level tools, you can look at our training at goengineer.com forward slash training. And I'll pull up our training webpage right here. So this is our training webpage that you can go to and learn more about our training events and what we do for all of these different tools here. And lastly, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash go engineer. I hope you enjoyed this webinar.